This morning, if you would, turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy. We will be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 18 to chapter 2, verse 7, which you'll have to flip the page there for that. That is page, if you're looking in the Pew Bible, 1177 into 1178. And once more, that's uh, 1 Timothy, beginning in chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. There is scarcely anything so so dull and meaningless, as Bible doctrine taught for its own sake. Truth, divorced from life, is not truth in its biblical sense, but something else and something less. Noted author and uh, pastor A.W. Tozer makes the point that biblical truth was never intended to be used just for our brains. (laughs) It was not just simply meant for information. We need both truth and life, and we do need both. We need doctrine and we need the practice of discipline. And those things include prayer and fasting. I don't know that we talk about fasting enough and evangelism. Furthermore, one cannot be strong apart from the other. It's important that we have strong doctrine and hold to sound doctrine. That's emphasized throughout the pastoral epistles. It's also important that we live it out. I think of this story that when I was in grade school, I had this tame, if you will, pirate-themed birthday party. And part of that birthday party was a hunt for buried treasure. Now, to start, my buddies and I had a rather ambiguous map and one clue card. My dad did this. It was great. The, The clue helped to find the location of the next clue. So each time we solved the riddle on that clue and went to the correct spot, the map would become more clear. Well, after a good deal of effort, we finally put the map together and found the treasure. We didn't just need a map. We need to engage with the map. The buried treasure wasn't going to find us, after all. (laughs) We had to find it. And that's the way it is with doctrine and discipline. Doctrines are not God. They are only a kind of map, says C.S. Lewis. And I believe he's correct. The most effective way to prevent or counter bad doctrine is to live the worshipful life. And the value of that worshipful life is the belief which buttresses it. And that's the message Paul instructs Timothy regarding, uh, excuse me, to the Ephesian church in this morning's text. What a congregation believes expresses itself out in how we worship. What a congregation believes expresses itself out in how we worship. So to, to Timothy, Paul addresses major internal issues in Ephesus. Now, a brief look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 in summary form informs us that Paul is writing to his young pupil, Timothy, and he's calling him to stay there in Ephesus so that he may um, com- command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. The Ephesian church was at that point in time under threat from a number of false teachers. Now, the question would be, what was the substance of their teaching? Well, for one, the text says that they were devoting themselves to myths 
and to endless genealogies. Then just a little while later, according to verse 7, it says that they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. So I think this hints at some things going on here, right? That there was a lot of just speculations being talked about. And there was also a lot of legalism. There's actually something else, and we're going to get to that later on in the message, so hold on, uh, but we'll get into that. This threat warranted urgency, and there's a great amount of urgency in Paul's tone in this text, from Paul to Timothy. So now again, we turn to this morning's text in verse 18. In verse 18, Paul charges Timothy, that's, that's a heavy word there, charging, ordering Timothy, with the same gospel proclamation that was stated in verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that's going to kind of be really a theme throughout this morning. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He is the one in whom the earliest Christians professed in one of the earlier creeds of the church to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The experienced apostle recognizes that Timothy will face spiritual warfare in Ephesus. In fact, it's already running rampant. According to verse 20, two men are named, Hymenaeus and Alexander, and they have rejected the gospel and had chosen instead to spew blasphemy. Now, blaspheme, what is it? To blaspheme is to speak with contempt about God, to be um, defiantly irreverent. It is far more extensive than just simply substituting the word gosh for the Lord's name. Trusting in stars to tell one's future is a form of blasphemy. The word rejected in verse 20 is similar to what the Lord repeatedly says of Judah and Jerusalem in the book of Jeremiah. For instance, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 19 states, Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have, there it is, rejected it. See, like the people of Judah, Hymenaeus and Alexander were exposed to the truth. They were hearing of the truth. They were around Christians, but they were not assenting to the truth. They were not submitting to God's truth. And because of this, Paul says, he has handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, this is kind of tricky, right? Hand it over to Satan. What could Paul mean by this? Does he look for the accuser to strike them down with illness? Could he even mean that he is calling for their death? If so, how could they literally be, if you will, learn or be disciplined not to blaspheme? Well, in the case of grotesque sexual immorality in the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul similarly commanded this word. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, this is important because he then expresses a purpose so that so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So significantly in both these texts, the delivering of names of congregants to Satan was followed by stating a higher redemptive purpose. In other words, they are to be cast out. Absolutely. It is good and it is important for the church to be healthy. And it is not good for false teaching to be in the church. But it is also for this purpose, not to just get rid of someone and then ignore them forever or to just pretend like they're not even existing. No, it was for a redemptive purpose. And we're going to get into how we should, as a church, respond to those teachers. See, it was for their eventual good. Thus, I think the message is clear here that Hymenaeus and Alexander are to be sent out of the Christian fellowship and into the unbelieving world where Satan devours like a lion. And it is with then prayer, prayer, that their eyes would be opened to the futility of their teaching and the futility of their sin, that they may repent, that they may repent and be forgiven. Now, at this point, you may ask, well, Pastor Peter, isn't this a bit too lenient? Isn't this a little too tolerant? Shouldn't the blasphemer suffer? Paul admitted that he too wants blaspheme the Lord. 
by persecuting his church. And yet he received mercy for his ignorance. But here's the simple truth that we must face, all of us, that at one point or another, whether maliciously or ignorantly, we have all blasphemed the name of Christ. And our only hope is that Jesus himself was blasphemed as he became the penalty for blasphemers. And being delivered up for sinners to bear the penalty of self-promoting, God-denying, personal kingdom builders, he was cursed. And in becoming the curse for humanity, he was cursed by humanity. So what should believers who are grounded in the gospel do about this? Well, Paul exhorts Timothy and the Ephesians to respond with prayer for all. It bears repeating that the original Bible manuscripts did not include chapter numbers, nor did they include verse numbers. I say that because verse uh, 1 of 1 Timothy 2 begins a new thought, yes. But the Greek word translated then indicates that there is a flow, a connection with chapter 1. There is a flow. So we have to keep in mind what just took place, what we just read at the end of chapter 1 as we enter into chapter 2. But what does praying for all people, as verse 1 indicates, have to do with Paul's discipline of Hymenaeus and Alexander? Well, first, let's dive into the various forms of prayer in verse 1. And these are supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Let's break these down. Supplications or requests denote a sense of desire or need. These are more like general prayers, if you will. The next category, which interestingly appears 13 times by Paul in his letters, is translated prayers, but these represent public prayers to God on behalf of other people. Intercessions are intimate, conversational prayers. The church father Origen wrote of these prayers that they imply a boldness of access to God's presence. I love that. A boldness of access to God's presence. And finally, prayers of thanksgiving, probably the one that's easiest to define, are giving thanks, are those prayers in which we express gratitude to our God. Scholar Ben Witherington observes how all of these forms of prayer made in and by the community of faith, the Christians, are to be used to pray for those outside the community. We see Paul implore these kinds of prayers and that be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions. That Paul uses the word kings here, applied not only to the Roman emperor, but all of the client kings. You know, you're familiar, of course, with Jesus' time and Herod the Great, when it was a client king. He was inserted by the Roman Empire to lead Judah. So it's all of them. And this is significant because in the context of 1 Timothy, who was the ruler but the emperor Nero? And if you know anything about the Roman emperor Nero, you know that he was busy at the time burning Christians alive. So if we're to pray for him, I can't imagine anyone we're not to pray for. The lesson is that even the heretics that were mentioned in 1 Timothy 1 were not to be excluded from prayer. A relevant application of this came to me through April, and she enjoys listening to a woman, I hope I get this right, Melissa Doherty, I'm just practicing that one, Doherty, a born-again believer who uh, discussed in an interview one of the sinister beliefs affecting churches today, New Age Spiritualism. Having herself once bought into this false teaching, Melissa is passionate about letting Christians know of its signs and its dangers which can basically be summed up as making God out of a religious salad bar. I thought that was a helpful analogy. I'll take a little Hindu here. I'll take a little Islam there. Oh, I like this about Jesus. I'll I'll add that too. And so it would be understandable if Melissa was angry about this. But after naming by name certain new age preachers and preachers who very kind of subtly preach that kind of message, she then said this. I thought this was... Very interesting. She looked at the, at the camera and she said, everybody pray for these people. I think it's really important to understand that these are still people and still need our prayers. They need the gospel. They need the gospel. Melissa gets it. 
Her strong theological conviction has moved her to not only speak truth, but to pray for those who are without hope, apart from the gospel and apart from change. Indeed, I believe finding and holding a proper answer to the question, whom did Jesus die to save, serves as the basis for this kind of praying. The effects of this prayer are good in the sight of a God who saves. We should not be surprised by Paul's urging to pray. Remember that in Ephesians 6, Paul exhorts the same church to be put to put on the whole armor of God. And this is part of the call for the saints to be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplication. But in the context of false teaching, for what purpose does Paul command this universal praying? Well, he answers that question in verses 2 and 3, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. A Christian community at this time, like many of the books of the New Testament, was a small minority. Now, some of those who were in Rome even considered Christianity to be some sort of like Judaistic sect, if you will. It was kind of a byproduct of Judaism. They should expect persecution, and indeed we see throughout the early time of the church there were persecutions. Nevertheless, it would have been unwise for them to, if you will, upset the apple cart unnecessarily. In other words, that they should be set an example of peace and of love in their community while also standing against uh, sin. So turning to verse 3, it is important to note that what is good refers actually back to verse 1, that prayer should be made for all without exception. And this he deems good in a way beautiful and excellent. That is actually the definition of good, beautiful. Paul uses a formula here from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28. Be careful to obey all my commands, because you will be doing what is, here it is, good and pleasing to the Lord your God. In the New Testament church, so this is fascinating to me, that in the New Testament church, prayer replaces sacrifice as communal worship to the Lord. And the grounding of all this is found in that rich theological truth of verses 4 through 6. Who desires, God, who desires all people to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So here, the primary doctrine of of the Old Testament, God is one, is affirmed. This is one of the richest theological verses in the Bible. God is one, is affirmed. But then comes the difference, one mediator. The one who intervened with the peace of God, whom Job longed for and the prophets anticipated, was Jesus. And he, Paul repeats, came for the salvation of there is the word all. Now, my personal convictions on this is that I think it best to interpret this as salvation has been provided for all, but only those who believe are saved. And in the process, Paul is also confronting the elitist exclusivism of the false teachers. There's the third characteristic of these false teachers. They were elitist and they were exclusive. They believed that they were the, they were the real teachers. They were the real truth holders. Witherington observes how the passive verb to be saved seems to imply that human response or acceptance to the gift of salvation is necessary for it to be actualized. It's interesting that even John Calvin had to confess that this demonstrates that God has at heart the salvation of all because he invites all to the knowledge of the truth. It is certain that all those to whom the gospel is addressed are invited to the hope of eternal life. So, you know, it's interesting. The majority of my life, I have to confess, I've enjoyed watching the New England Patriots. (laughs) been a faithful fan. I almost never watch another team. And believe me, there is a point to this. (laughs) But several weeks ago, early in this month, April and I were hanging out, and I thought, eh, I just was interested. I'll catch the score of the Bengals-Bills game. Some of you will already know where I'm going with this. I turned the TV moments after the hit that led to Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin collapsing on the field. For nine minutes, medical professionals administered CPR to Hamlin. 
Like all who viewed this scene, I was shocked. At one point, Buffalo's coach, Sean McDermott, called the team to huddle together, and he led them in prayer. They all prayed, the whole team. You see, Sean McDermott is open about his born-again faith in Christ. The following week, ESPN analyst and Christian Dan Orlovsky didn't just express thoughts and prayers. He actually closed his eyes, he bowed his head, and he prayed to his Savior on live TV. As I heard it said, life is fragile. Handle it with prayer. Incredibly, Hamlin recovered in a matter of weeks. But it's not that incredible, is it? (laughs) It was a reminder to me that there is immense and incredible power in our prayers for those who believe, and yes, for those who don't. And the power is wielded in the name of a Savior who died for all. Those in positions of authority should be granted love as brothers in Christ with respect and with prayer. But I think we'd all agree that no leader should be put on a pedestal. I shouldn't, no other should. The theologian John Calvin did good things in the name of Christ during the Reformation. I actually do agree with him on the teaching with the Lord's Supper that it is a deeply spiritual and unifying meal. But when Jacques Gruet, a theologian with differing views, placed a letter in Calvin's Geneva pulpit, calling him a hypocrite. He was arrested, tortured for a month, and beheaded on July 26, 1547. Gruet's own theological book was later found and burned along with the house while his wife was thrown out into the streets to watch this. His role in the execution of Michael Servetus was also shrouded in controversy. In a personal letter written to a friend, Calvin wrote, Servetus offers to come hither, if it be agreeable to me. But I am unwilling to pledge my word for his safety, for if he shall come, I shall never permit him to depart alive, provided my authority be of any avail. You are welcome to disagree with me. You are welcome to agree with John Calvin's teachings. But I would just lovingly caution anyone from putting him or anyone else on a pedestal. It's a warning I actually take to heart. See, I had a shortcoming. In college, I became quite a fan of Ravi Zacharias. His compelling storytelling and brilliance captivated me. I'll never forget when he came to Founders Week, and I was just one of the first in line to shake his hand and see him. I was so excited. Before his passing, I learned how he came under investigation. Eventually, the evidence against him of sexual misconduct became such that the pedestal that I once held him on very quickly collapsed. Like so many, I was disappointed, disappointed by him. But over time, this word of conviction hit me, and it hit me hard. How often did I really take the time to pray for Ravi Zacharias? How often did I pray for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries before and after all this was taking place? And the hard, hard truth that I had to answer for myself is not very much, certainly not enough. I believe that this is the message that we need to apply. Oh, yes, we can be upset that there are false teachers. And indeed, that the scriptures are clear of the dangers of it and how we are to fight against it. But are we also praying for those who hold it? Praying earnestly. Because it's not just about these days on earth. We talk about life and being sacred. But we are also talking about an eternal destiny. We're talking about an eternal destiny separated from God for those who teach this. And it's not something I wish upon anyone. Instead of just harboring anger towards those who fail and teach falsely, 1 Timothy teaches us that we should first and foremost bring these people to the Lord in our prayers. Good theology teaches us that we are all sinners with a Savior whose power through the cross is, I believe, quantitatively and qualitatively greater than that first sin and that every other sin. What a congregation believes expresses itself in how we worship. Let us pray. Lord our God, your word is true. Lord our God, your word is sacred. Lord our God, you have called us to teach that which is sound the true gospel. And we must recognize and call out false teaching where it is. 
That is important. That is good. I also believe that in our excommunication, we should be very quick to pray. And we should be very humble. We should be very quick to see the sins in our own hearts and to be broken over it, to beg at the mercy seat of Christ, yet also knowing that you are a God who forgives and you do not condemn. So, Father, I pray that this teaching would honor you today. For many of us, maybe it's bringing some things forth that are hard or maybe need processing. I just pray, Lord, faithfully that your Holy Spirit would speak to all of us today and move us in a way that pleases you. In your name, amen. I definitely encourage you, actually, this is on a related note, to please come down for Bible Hour, as you will hear from, I believe, Lee Strobel on the topic of evangelism. What I find interesting and relevant here is that Lee Strobel, if you ever get to know his story, was an atheist. He was an atheist, a blasphemer, someone who didn't believe in Christ, looked down. In fact, I love the Case for Christ film. It shows how vehemently he wanted to disprove Christ. It backfired wonderfully. C.S. Lewis was no different. An atheist came to Christ. I also want to talk about Augustine. Augustine did not believe in Christ. Atheists went through all these other religion, faiths, Manichaeism, all that. But Monica prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. And Augustine became a believer. Will you pray? Will you pray for the lost? And will you pray for the false teachers? Pray for them and go in peace. Amen.